all, you can turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. I'm going to start off here in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. It says, Then he said to them all, he being Jesus, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever wants to lose his life for my sake will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of the Father and of the Holy Angels. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Amen? Amen. Father God, you are good. And it is a good thing to be able to be here and to worship you freely. To worship you without hindrance. There's nothing stopping us from giving our all this morning to exalt you. It is good to be able to come into your presence. What a, what a, what a privilege it is to be able to draw near to you, God. And I pray that we don't take it for granted. I pray that you can encourage all of us this morning with the goodness of your presence. Convict us to make a decision to be transformed by your word. Convict us to make a decision to be transformed into the likeness of your son as we drown ourselves in the power of your word, God. In the goodness of your spirit. Move me aside. Give us humble hearts. Help us to know you and to be more like you. In your son Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen. 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 Again, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you especially for worshiping uh, with us. If you're visiting, uh, there are a thousand other churches you can go to, a thousand other things you can listen to online. So it is always, always, always extremely encouraging when you decide to come join us uh, this morning. And the prayer is always that it's not just a visitation, they don't just come and hang out this morning, that, but that you will be impacted by what you experience here, and prayerfully, you'll come back and want to be a part of this family. Amen? Uh, you know, uh, today we're going to continue on in a sermon series called The Daily Cross. Dom actually started this sermon series three weeks ago in a sermon entitled uh, Self-Denying Power. Now, since then, it's been two weeks. We had a spectacular spring fest. And let me say this. Uh, God has been smiling favor favorably upon us because that was such a beautiful and a nice day. We've had spring fest before where the heat of the sun decided to not make it that pleasant of an experience, right? We're all sweating and wishing and, and waiting for the moment we get back into the air conditioning of our homes. But that wasn't the case two weeks ago. It was a great time. Uh, fire trucks. My, my kids thought the bouncy house was just uh, exceptional. They thought it was incredible. Uh, and then last week, we had a phenomenal Women's Day. Amen. Come on, women. I know Terry Barrett from Charleston did a fantastic job. I know everybody was encouraged. Um, it was it was really an inspiring time, I've heard. Uh, and I actually, I actually did listen in to some as well. So uh, what I've heard was inspiring. Uh, so, but, but, but now we're back. And uh, we're continuing on with this sermon series. And uh, like I said, Dom started it three weeks ago. And he's talking about, we're talking about this whole idea of what it means and what it takes. What's the cost of actually following Jesus? And so I read Luke 9 to start off with. Now, Luke 9 is, uh, I think, for our movement, one of those scriptures that uh, is kind of a mantra, right? There's, there's Matthew 28, we love to go and make disciples, but then there's, there's, then there's Luke 9, 23. The concept of, okay, if we're going to be disciples, we have to deny ourselves and take up our crosses daily uh, and follow Jesus. So I'm going to break down that phrase really quickly. 
before we, we get deep into it. I just want to look at it face value, okay? First thing he says is, if anyone, let's stop right there. Anyone, who is included in the concept of anyone? Everyone. Everyone. All right, so, so that means that this scripture applies to all human beings, okay? If anyone, and then it says, would come after me, which that means if anyone wants to follow me, if anyone wants to be my disciple, if anyone wants to be my apprentice, it's another word there, disciple and apprentice, they have the same meaning. If anyone wants to be a Christian, okay? And I think that last one, society kind of gives a different definition to. But all these phrases mean the same thing. Disciple, apprentice, Christian, a Christ follower. If anyone would come after me, if anyone wants to be a Christian, and then the, 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 what he says right after that is that they must. They must. Now that word must doesn't mean, well, this is a suggestion for a possibly good Christian lifestyle. Doesn't mean, hey, this is, you know, this is completely optional, right? That if you want to follow me, you can take or leave what I'm about to say. Is that what, is that what must means? What does must mean? It's, it's absolutely necessary to follow Jesus and be a Christian, to do what comes next, all right? So this is a non-negotiable issue. Now, it would be awesome. It would be really nice if the scripture said, if anyone would come after me, he must believe in me deeply in his heart, and he will be saved. That would be awesome. It would mean that I would have to think a lot less about the Christian life that I live. It would mean that in one moment, I could have a cognitive spark, and everything else is straight for the rest of my life. I would like if the Bible said that. The problem is, I can't reshape and rewrite the Bible. So as we read it this morning, let's just be real about what the Bible says to us. Amen? Amen. What comes next is a non-negotiable. If anyone wants to be a Christian, he must, and he gives us three things, he says, deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow them. Now, Dom talked all about denying yourself in his sermon. And while these concepts that I'm going to talk about this morning will bleed together with his sermon, I want to take some time today to talk about the next command. This is the Daily Cross Part 2. Take up your cross. Take up your cross. Now, he says... Deny yourself, and he says, take up your cross, and he has a word there, take up your cross, it says, daily. Daily. Luke is actually the only gospel writer that adds that word daily to the command. He emphasizes that following Jesus was not a seasonal or episodic thing, but something that should alter Every single day of our lives. You know, uh, we did a class on evangelism this last Wednesday. And uh, the, the topic of evangelism, it is challenging to me, I realize, because it's, it's not just about sharing the good news of what God has done in your, in your life. I mean, that's a big part of it. But to make a disciple... Right, what, 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 what we're called to do in Matthew 28, to make a disciple is actually, it's a pretty complicated situation. Why? Because being a Christian is a complete overhaul of the way that you see the world. It is a complete shifting of your perspective. Now, last year, I kind of, in some of my sermons, I kind of alluded to what the theme was going to be this year. Uh, the theme is true discipleship this year, but last year when I alluded to it, I used the words, I said, we're going to be talking about radical discipleship. 
And as we, as, as I, as we looked and as I was planning and as I was writing, I realized that that, that phrase, radical discipleship, didn't actually fit what we were going to be talking about. Because discipleship in and of itself is radical. Discipleship in and of itself is a holy and set apart thing. So I said, well, I'm not going to call it radical discipleship. That, that's, that's redundant. It's simply true discipleship. It's simply what we're called to do. We're not called to be super Christians. We're called to be Christians. It's just that the idea, it's just the, the world does not have a good idea of what it means to be a Christian. And so, as I was writing these uh, sermon series, actually in my notes, beside each of these series, it says something like radical intimacy, Right? Or Radical Quiet Times. Or uh, this sermon series, the, the subtitle beside it was Radical Repentance. Now when I talk about repentance, I'm not talking about, uh, I'm not just talking about the idea of turning away from your sin. Uh, repentance, uh, what the word metanoia, what that word means is a change of mind that leads to a transformed character. A change of mind that leads to a change of action. So when Jesus says here, when he lays out what it means to follow him, he's telling us we're going to have to shift the way we think about the world. We're going to have to shift the way we perceive reality. We now have to see the world through the eyes of Jesus. The scripture says we regard no one from a worldly point of view from this point forward. We have to see the world like God wants us to see the world. And honestly, like if we're not willing to repent, we won't actually able be able to follow Jesus. Because if you're not thinking like Jesus, you won't be able to act like him. Some of us try very hard to act like Jesus without ever trying to really change our minds. That's why... You can't stop sinning. That's why you can't stop your bad habits because it starts here, not here. Have you allowed the word to change your mind? Have you allowed Jesus to change how you think and how you perceive the world? Following Jesus, if we're going to shift our perception of how we see things, following Jesus is a daily Thing. Again, not seasonal, not episodic. You know, I was in campus ministry. I led the campus ministry for eight years uh, before my wife and I shift positions. And in campus ministry, you see a lot of people who come and go. Because people are young and they're trying things out and they're trying to figure out their lives and, and they, they, they experience Jesus and he's awesome for a second and he's awesome for a time, but then he doesn't give them what what they think that he promised or they don't get what they want or uh, it, it ends up being hard or they don't want to read their Bibles or they don't want, for whatever reason, it was just a semester. For whatever reason, it was just a year or two. For whatever reason, it was just a season in their lives. Jesus says, well, that's not Christianity. That's not what I'm calling people to. I'm calling people to a very daily, consistent thing. Like I said, the theme for this year is true discipleship, but the goal of my hope is that everybody in this congregation understands exactly what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus. And that a part of that understanding is recognizing that discipleship is a daily endeavor. Deny yourself and everything that goes along with that, it needs to happen daily. Taking up your cross has to happen daily. And let's talk about that, right? That's what this sermon is about, taking up your cross. What does that mean exactly? You know, if you've been around for many years, you can probably talk about this, you can probably teach it, you can probably tell somebody exactly what that phrase means. But for those of you who maybe are newly acquainted with this scripture, I want to give you a brief recap of what it means. Remember this when you read the Bible. Context matters. 
Context matters. There is no single scripture that exists in a vacuum, sitting alone by itself. Context always matter, matters. And even though Jesus died on the cross, making the symbol of a cross almost synonymous with our entire faith, right? Christians walk around all the time with a cross on their neck, signifying that they are a Christian. While Jesus was alive, that cross had a very different meaning. The cross was an instrument used to publicly execute criminals in the most humiliating way possible. And actually, contrary to the popular belief, and, and even what a lot of us have studied out when it comes to the very scientific particular nature of uh, the brutality of crucifixion, I was reading something the other day that said, you know, sometimes they just haphazardly threw up, uh, uh, threw up a tree and nailed those criminals to that thing in any manner they saw fit, in any position they saw fit. Because the goal was to nail you to that thing and hang you up so that everybody could see you and laugh at you and recognize that you were a criminal. The cross was a torture device designed to give bad people slow and grueling deaths. And Jesus' audience, those who he was preaching to, would have been very familiar with crucifixion for two primary reasons. The first was that it was a normal means of execution uh, for the state that they belonged to. But the second was that there was a Jewish rebellion that took place several years before the start of the Gospels, resulting in the humiliation of the Jews by publicly executing many of them along the road to Jerusalem so that all the Jews who walked into the city could see their Jewish brothers and sisters nailed to crosses and get in their minds, don't mess with Rome. Stay in your place. Do not try to usurp our authority. We will make an example of you. And... Just, I mean, just, just, just think about how traumatizing that would be. <clears throat> think about the kind of statement that was being made there. Now, that second reason is important to this sermon because when Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom, he came also claiming to be the king of the kingdom he was proclaiming. And Rome was already very tired of these Jews trying to rebel. That's why they killed Jesus. They saw him as an instigator to a new rebellion. And how did they kill Jesus? The same way they killed all the other Jewish rebels. They hung him on a cross. So, context matters. When Jesus preaches here in Luke 9, he's speaking to an audience that already hated the idea of the cross. He's speaking to people who hate the cross because they know that the cross represents a humiliating death. That is what the cross represented, a humiliating death. And then Jesus goes on, recognizing the context, understanding exactly what they would be thinking about the cross. He goes on and he preaches that if you want to be his disciple, you need to be ready to take up your cross. To them, what Jesus was saying was you need to be ready. If you're going to follow me, if you're going to be a Christian, you need to be ready to die in a very humiliating way. Context matters. That's what that means. You take up your cross daily, it means that every day you need to be ready and willing to die in a humiliating way. I think that is a great team building tactic. Right? If you're really trying to get people to follow you, really trying to build an awesome team, you tell them, look, if you follow me, you're probably going to get brutalized. Not only that, 
It's going to be humiliating. It's going to be humiliating. You know, many Christians have taken this scripture and they've done what I like to call, they've Christianized it. What I mean is they've taken it and they've made it entirely metaphorical, right? Explaining it away by saying, well, he meant to crucify your sinful nature, David. To crucify the bad parts about yourself that only the Jesus Christ-like parts remain. And amen. That's not a bad sentiment. It's actually a beautiful idea. It's actually even a scriptural idea. I just don't think that this scripture is the best scripture in context to make that point. There are other scriptures if you'd like to make that point. Colossians 3 verse 5 starts off with the phrase, Put to death, therefore. Whatever belongs to your earthly nature. The concept is certainly there. In fact, because it's there, let's part up there for a second. Because I still think it's a great point to make, so let's make it. Crucify your sinful nature. There are many things about Christianity that I do not naturally want to do. Does anybody understand what I say when I mean that? Does anyone relate to me when I say something like that? And I've shared this before, right? In my sinful nature, I'm an extremely lazy person. Like, I am completely okay being one of those human beings that humans evolved into from the movie Wall E. I don't know if you've seen it, but Earth has gone to ruins because all the humans have gone up into ships and they sit in recliner chairs. And they've grown really, really, really obese because all they do is watch TV and eat food. Now, I'm like, that doesn't sound too bad. I don't like moving my body too much anyways. That sounds good to me. Doesn't sound healthy, but, you know. I don't want to read my Bible every day. Can I relate to me in that? Sometimes I try to come up with all kinds of excuses. Well, I got to do this, 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 this. I'm, I may not get to it. I don't want to read my Bible every day. Sometimes it's a hassle. I don't want to pray every day. Right? That, that, that means I got to be all introspective about my own life. That means I actually got to read the Bible. It means I got to think about you guys and y'all's problems and y'all's sin. I got to pray about you. <laughs> I don't want to do that every day, guys. I don't want to deal with your problems every day. I don't want to make new friends every day. Or in general. I don't want to do that once a year. I don't want to disciple people. Especially when half the time they don't even listen to me. And I don't want to be discipled by people. I'm already doing this stuff. Don't tell me what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> I don't want to be hospitable. That means I gotta invite y'all over. Y'all gonna make a mess at my house and I gotta clean it up. I don't want to be vulnerable to show the sinful parts of myself. To be humble and say that this hurt me or that hurt me. I don't want to be pure. It's a lot easier to just want to go the way of my sinful nature. And on top of all the things I don't want to do when it comes to being a Christian, there are a thousand things that the world has to offer that I actually do want to do. Sin isn't the broccoli of our lives, it's the candy. Sin is not the healthy part, it's the donuts. You know, I was at a wedding yesterday, Matthew, Jean Baptiste, and Kimberly Loman got married, amen, it was a great time. We had a great time, and, and sinfully, they had a donut wall. Can you believe that? Those wretches. And you know, and, and you know, I was walking by it, and I don't know, someone was on the ground. I slipped, and like my hand grabbed two of them, <laughs> and and I ate them. I don't know. They were in sin, not me. They put it up there. Now I needed the uh, I needed the energy for the dance party that came later. You know, I danced all that sugar off. Sin is the candy 
of our lives, not the broccoli. Sin sounds good. Sin tastes good. Sin feels good. Our natural selves crave sin. I remember one time a brother came to me, him and his girlfriend, uh, they had set pretty strict boundaries and they had ended up falling into a bit of sin and uh, they'd made out and done a few other things and he came back to me and, uh, you know, he's kind of broken hearted and he's confessing this sin and then, he, and then he says, he says he was scared. He says, you know, uh, we did this thing and he says, you know, I, I'm scared because he said, I liked it. It felt good. And I said, are you dumb? <laughs> like, like, did you think you wouldn't? If, if you wouldn't like doing those things, you wouldn't need boundaries against them. You, you wouldn't need to set up your life in a way that avoids those things. Sin feels good. You're not going to do sin and be like, ugh. I didn't like that. I mean, you know, some sin you might do that with. But a lot, it takes a long time for us to realize the damage it's having on our lives. Sin feels good, guys. Our, our natural selves crave sin. So the Christianized version of this command, take up your cross daily, it, daily it, it tells me that all of those sinful cravings that I have, I need to crucify those things. It tells me that I need to be violently hostile towards those godless thoughts, towards those godless feelings, and towards those godless actions that I had within me. Listen, the same anger and violence that the Romans used to kill Jesus... We need to channel that same anger and violence. We need to channel those same emotions and passions, but except to kill our sinful cravings and our sinful actions. Is that how violently hostile we are towards our sin? So, how's that going for you this morning? Are you winning that battle on a daily basis? Are you killing your sin... Or is your sin killing you? Let me tell you this. There is no middle ground. There is no, well, you know, I'm not killing it, but it's not really killing me either. We kind of got a good thing going. We got a good balance. My sin treats me well every once in a while. It's either killing you or you are killing it. I think for some of us, this idea is scary. Some of us are so in love with the sinful parts of ourselves that we mourn the idea of letting them go. We mourn the idea of putting those pieces of ourselves to death. So I want to ask a question this morning. I want every single one of us to really think about this question. Meditate on it. Please internalize it. Pray about it this week. What parts of yourself are you unwilling to crucify? Just think about it. Be real with yourself. What parts of yourself are you unwilling to crucify? And we all have those parts, right? Some of us are gung-ho about crucifying and repenting kind of those outward sins, those sins that other people see. But then there are some sins that we hide away. Some sins that we just, we love too much and, and we cannot fathom life without them. Jesus is good and all, but this thing, even if I have to hide it from my brothers and sisters, this thing is just, it's just too good. When we become Christians, when we follow Jesus, everything goes in the waters. Nothing is left out. I'm going to talk more about that concept in a seven-part series come the summer. But everything goes on. What parts of your life are you unwilling to crucify? But again, that that whole point, that's a sermon I've preached before. It's a sermon you've heard before. In fact, you heard it a few weeks ago when Don preached about denying yourself. So let's go a little bit deeper, right? Let's step into, uh, let's step away from the Christianized version of this scripture and look at the contextual version, all right? What does Jesus say in the context? I'm going to read the scripture again. And he said to them all, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? Jesus calls us to three things here. 
Deny yourselves, take up your cross daily, follow him. The word follow. The word follow used here in Luke 9. I learned this from Ed Anton about 10 years ago at a leader's retreat. The word is akalotheo. All right? It doesn't mean just to follow someone. It means to enlist. Okay? It's the same concept that a soldier has in his mind when he joins the army. This wasn't as simple as learning someone's discipline. This was an all-encompassing handing one's life over to an authority for the sake of being utilized and weaponized for that authority. That's what this word means. To enlist, to hand yourself over completely. To be used by this authority. This is a word of allegiance. It is a swearing of oneself absolutely to the cause. It was a word meaning if you join this movement, you better be ready to die for this movement. And that makes the rest of the scripture make a lot of sense. Right? For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? Jesus says here, your life is on the line. This goes back to the suffering series, right? Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, I'm just going to give you a heads up. I'm going to be persecuted. I'm going to be humiliated. I'm going to be crucified. And whatever happens to me, it's probably going to happen to you too. For a quiet time series, you should go get this book called The Fox's Book of Martyrs. Okay? Fox's Book of Martyrs. It is an account of a lot of the Christians in the first century and all the ways that they were brutally murdered. The opening, the the, the prologue to this book is a disciple named Polycarp who was uh, a disciple of uh, John. John had trained him in ministry. Polycarp, uh, they have him. They're about to burn him at the stake. And uh, as they light the fires, and, and the fires are going, they hear Polycarp laughing. And he says, add more wood. This is not enough yet. Give me more. Because I'm going to show you how much I'm willing to suffer for the God that I love. The more you add, the more fiery I will become. That's wild. But that's the kind of attitude the disciples had in the first century church. Is that how we would respond today to being put to death for the sake of Jesus? You know, Jesus was not preaching to modern day America. He wasn't teaching Western Christianity. Billions of people in Jesus' day and age did not claim to agree or align with Jesus' way. They did not claim to align with Jesus' truth or Jesus' life. In Jesus' day, living Jesus' way would get you killed, and it would be that way for 300 years until Christianity became the official religion of Rome. I've said this before, but again, every apostle that followed Jesus was murdered, brutally murdered, except for John. John was, though, he was thrown into a vat of boiling oil, but he didn't die. And then he was exiled. I don't know what's worse. The forces that ruled the world could not allow the Christians to spread God's kingdom because God's kingdom was contrary to the world that they wanted. God's kingdom will always be contrary to the world that we live in, church. God's kingdom turns the world's authority upside down. So that the powers that be always decide to strike back. So what did they do? They killed the Christ and they killed his Christians. Not knowing that Jesus had prepared his disciples for their response. They slaughtered true disciples not knowing that God's power was made perfect in weakness. Not knowing that by killing them, their blood became the water of life upon every seed that they planted while they lived. 
And for every death, many more chose to follow Jesus and die for the same worthy cause of the kingdom of heaven. The early Christians took this command seriously because when they heard to take up your cross daily, they understood it as if you follow me, you need to be ready to die any day for the sake of this kingdom. For them, it was all or nothing. Jesus was Lord of all or he was Lord of nothing at all. There was no in between. And we see an almost cosmic contest happening here. Jesus says, what good is it to gain the world and yet lose or forfeit your very self? This phrase means the choice is simple. We either love and live for the world or we love and live for Jesus and his kingdom. There is no in between. The scary thing about this whole idea is what happened in the fourth century. A Roman emperor by the name of Constantine, because he felt like God did him a favor, decided to legalize Christianity instead of persecute it. In fact, he made it the official religion of Rome. Those who were previously being murdered for following Jesus were now celebrated with the financial backing of the Roman Empire. And those who refused Jesus could now be put to death. What are the natural ramifications of a decision like that? Just think about it. Well, on the positive side, the worldly powers preserved Christianity, allowing us, 2,000 years later, to still know about it. So there is some good that comes out of it. But on the negative side, people were being coerced into following Christianity. Meaning, genuine, true discipleship was a lot harder to come by as religion, dogma, doctrine, denominations, and all other manner of church politics and dense theology made knowing God and his son Jesus a complicated mess. The pros and cons of Constantine were numerous, but I want to warn us all this morning of a con that persists today, and it has the perpetual power to destroy the faith of many. And please listen as we're about to talk about this. One thing that happened when Constantine made Rome adopt Christianity, one of, the, one of the ramifications was that instead of fighting God's kingdom, Rome sought to hijack the kingdom instead. And this is a demonic tactic that is still in full swing today. The world, the world wants to reshape Christianity to its image. The world wants so badly to tell Jesus what his Bible means. The world wants to rewrite the words. It wants to redefine the words. It wants to add words and it wants to take words away. The world wants to mutilate the scriptures just like Rome mutilated Jesus so that the Bible fits under its authority instead of upends it. Since the days of Jesus, the world has crucified the truth and still continues to do so. And if we're not careful, if we're not willing to give up our lives for the sake of the truth, we will shrink back and join the world in its destruction of sound doctrine. What do I mean by that? Bear with me. The primary way that the world hijacks our faith and crucifies the truth is to say that Christians have misinterpreted scripture for centuries now. We've actually had it all wrong. All the scholars, all the people who knew Greek and studied it and thoroughly went through these things. We've had it wrong the whole time. And because of new research and teachings, we are actually able to partake in sins once thought forbidden. It's Satan's old phrase. Surely you will not die. But if you eat of it, you will become like God. Your eyes will be opened. Now, listen, let me say this. 
There is a truth, sorry, there is a difference between sin and disputable matters, okay? Disputable matters include things falling under the umbrella of what I call orderly worship, conversations about head coverings and gender roles, and when we, when we take communion and how we take communion, these are not sin and salvation issues, even though some congregations and some fellowships feel strongly enough about these things to break fellowship with one another. But I'm not talking about those debatable matters this morning. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about sin. Okay? The world is taking the scriptures and performing this exegetical dance to relieve Christians of their discipline of self-denial by approving of actual sin. The world is telling us today that sexual immorality is okay as long as it's between two consenting adults who love each other and aren't married to different people. That the scriptures don't actually mean what we thought they meant. The world is telling us that homosexuality is okay. That the scriptures don't really take into the account, don't take into account the kind practice today. The world is telling us that pornography is okay. It's telling us that hating our enemies is okay. That chasing money, that's fine. That being ungrateful, that, that's, that's totally fine. The world is teaching us that divorcing our spouses is a vital option for the Christian. It's telling us that cursing and foul language is okay. It's telling us that gluttony and debauchery is okay, that violence is okay. The world is telling us that nationalism and worshiping your country and your president, it's telling us that that's okay, that that's godly or biblical. The world is telling us that worshiping multiple gods is okay. It's telling us that it's judgmental to hold our brothers and sisters accountable for sin. Don't you dare do that. My relationship with God is my relationship. You have no say in it. Don't call me out of my sin. You are not to judge me. The Bible does not say that, church. The world is telling us that it's arrogant to evangelize and share our faith. That it's weird to invite people into our homes and build friendships. That it's naive and stupid to forgive even when it doesn't benefit us. And to be honest, all of this can be very confusing. We blame Eve for falling for Satan's schemes, but we got to give it to him. The guy is crafty. It was Jesus' way to, listen to this. It was Jesus' way to deconstruct the Jewish religion. But he did it using the scriptures to weed out the world. And we can think that we're doing that when we deconstruct the, the scriptures today, but the danger today is that the deconstruction that's typically happening is using the world and its logic to question the truth and the authority of the scriptures. It's the opposite of what Jesus was doing. It's the opposite. The deconstruction that we're tempted to practice seeks to deny Jesus as king in our lives. And the scary part is, if we stand on the truth, if we stand on the scriptures, the world will do to us what it does to the truth. If we stand for the truth, then the world will do to us exactly what it's done to the truth. We will be ridiculed. We will be condemned, will be canceled and called bigots and given every kind of phobia that exists in the book. And here's the deal. Some of us cannot handle being the bad guy. Some of us can't handle it. Some of us would rather gain the love of the world rather than lose or forfeit your very self. So what does this mean for us? 
What does it mean for us to take up our cross daily in today's world with these nuanced problems that we're facing? Well, here are a few things. We need to, as Christians, be ready to accept and embrace persecution. Jesus promised it. We cannot be afraid of the world looking at us and tell us, telling us for the bad. We cannot be afraid of, who knows, on a long enough timeline, us being actually physically persecuted for standing up for Jesus. We need to be more worried about being canceled by God rather than by man. One has far more. One has eternal ramifications. The other just makes you look weird in this life. More than that, we need to walk daily in the life-giving disciplines of Jesus. You know, I talked about Polycarp and how he laughed in the face of being burned at the stake. We cannot be there mentally if we're not reading our Bible, if we're not praying, if we are not arresting all of our thoughts and all of our, 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 our feelings and our emotions, if we are not training all of those things with the scripture and with prayer and making sure that the Holy Spirit is flourishing from us, if we are not practicing the life-giving disciplines of Jesus, then we will only experience the death that the world gives us. We've got to walk worthy of the gospel. More than that, we have to keep our love for God and his kingdom strong and consistent so that our love for the world does not overcome it. A lot of times what trips us up is our, is our self-righteousness. We tell ourselves we don't love the world. And therefore, we try to justify everything we do as spiritual. That's not the case. We love the world, church. We recognize it's evil, but we love it. You know, Nikki used an analogy on Wednesday. She said, you know, uh, trying to go against the world and, and, and going against your sinful nature is like walking on those moving sidewalks in the airport. And here's the deal. The world is going to take you in one direction whether you like it or not. You are not strong enough to overcome the tide of the world. And if you want to overcome it, like on those moving sidewalks, not only are you going to have to turn in the opposite direction, but you're actually going to have to work harder than the moving sidewalk to move in the opposite direction. You're going to have to work harder than the world is working to sweep you away. That means you have to lean into consistently the way of Jesus. Christianity is not a passive thing. You don't just, hey, I had faith, and now I'm always being swept away by the Holy Spirit. No, you have to lean into the Spirit. Allow those fruits to flourish in you. More than that, we need to be grounded in sound doctrine. Guys, Christianity is going in a weird direction. Like I talked about that exegetical dance. There are so many churches right now that are trying to get the Bible to say whatever it wants. And we will be tricked by this nonsense if we do not know our Bibles. If we are not reading the Word, if we are not deeply and intimately consuming the Word of God on a daily basis. We have to be grounded because the Bible says a time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. It's happening right now. And it's any doctrine that tells you, hey, that sin that you know you're not supposed to do, well, you can actually do it. Reject that wholly. You have to be grounded in sound doctrine. And we have to be committed and devoted to the fellowship church. So that we're never alone in the hard times. Here's the deal. Our church was at 430 members pre-pandemic. We sit at 320 right now. That's over 100 people gone. And now not all of those people are like left Jesus. Some of them moved away. Some of them left Jesus. And it may sound like I want people to be here and to join our church so that we can be a big church. That's why I'm about. No, listen. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. And the work of ministry is not easy. And we need as much help as humanly possible. 
So it's not the image of this church that I want to preserve or protect. I don't care about the image of this church. As long as we are reflecting the glory of God, I care about the purpose of this church. People will perceive us whenever way they want to perceive us. We need people who are willing to be committed disciples to stand beside us and to help us do the work of spreading God's kingdom because when the times get hard and we start to look like the crazy people, it is such a comfort to look beside them and see brothers and sisters that look in the eyes and say, bro, you're not crazy. Jesus is real and he's living and his word is true. And don't give up on Stand tall, stand strong, keep going, because we are in this thing with you. Cherish the fellowship. Cherish the brotherhood. Fight for it, because we need each other. Jesus called us, and he calls us to an absolute lifestyle. He calls us to an absolute allegiance to him and his kingdom. And it's an allegiance that we have to practice every single day of our lives. It's a calling that we can live up to only if we understand that Jesus died on the cross for the sake of saving us from the lies of Satan. He died to make us strong and indomitable. He died so that even in the face of the world trying to tear us apart, we each can shine bright with the truth and the glory of the presence of God. Let's pray now for the bread and the cup. God, you are good. I pray that we recognize that. And I pray that we recognize the difference between you and the world. Satan tries to muddy those lines so much. Pray that we can remember your son and the fact that he gave his life. He allowed his body to be broken and his blood to be spilled so that we could be transformed and rescued from the darkness of the world. Not so that we can join it. Not so that we can be deceived by God, but so that we could know you and know the truth. And as you and your son teaches us, so that truth can set us free. Let us be set free this morning as we each decide to deny ourselves, take up our crosses daily, and follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.